I invite the congregation to turn to Luke chapter 19. And everybody open up the Bible because we're going to be looking at several verses slowly as we go through the message this morning. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. There's a story of Palm Sunday that reminds me of a little boy that was sick on Palm Sunday. He had the flu and he was not feeling well, so his mom said, well, I'll stay home with you from church this morning, but your dad and your two little sisters are going to go to church and, and celebrate Palm Sunday. Well, his dad went to church along with his two little sisters and when they came home, they were waving the palm branches that they got during the children's message. And they were waving them around. And that little boy was curious. He, you know, why, why do you guys have palm branches? And his dad said, you see, when Jesus came to town on that very special day, they waved palm branches in the air and they shouted, Hosanna in honor to him. So we got palm branches and we did the same in church. The little boy got a discouraged look on his face. He said, oh, man, the one Sunday that I miss when I'm sick, Jesus shows up. <laughs> <laughs> As Jesus showed up in your life. And his briar said, where does Jesus live? In our heart. Not in his pocket, but in our hearts. As Jesus showed up in your life today. As I said today, today is Palm Sunday, the day where the Bible tells us that the whole city of Jerusalem threw a parade for Jesus. Now, how many here like parades? You know, parades are, are good things. I, I enjoy the parade that they always have in Genesis on Memorial Day. It honors our veterans. It makes us remember what uh, our country is built on. But parades are great. You stand up when the veterans walk by. The bands, the floats, the drill teams, the marching bands, and the candy that is thrown your way, it all adds to the fun. Parades are one of those things that, that people love and enjoy. But in a parade, you never quite know what's going to come next. You can look down the street and you can see some of the stuff that's coming down, but you never know what's going to come next in a parade. Life's a lot like that parade. You don't know what's going to come happen next. I think of the Boone family. How just a visit from the doctor's office can change so quickly your, your view of life. You don't know what's going to happen next. I think of Bob and Julie healthy and going down to Florida to spend time in Florida and Julie fell. You don't know what's going to happen next, do you, Julie? But you know what we have? We have Jesus with us all the time. And no matter what we face, no matter what comes next, we have the King of Kings with us. So this morning as we celebrate the King of Kings and his welcome to the city of Jerusalem, I want you to walk along with me to relive that exciting day. And the scripture passage comes from Luke chapter 19. But as we look at the scripture passage this morning, we don't know quite really what's going to happen next. Because on this day, on Palm Sunday, we celebrate joy but it's also bittersweet because even though we celebrate Jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem we know that somehow Friday is coming we know that Friday brings the cross and we know that many of those in that crowd that day that were shouting Hosanna Hosanna blessed is Jesus will be the same ones just a few days later that will be shouting crucify him he's a liar he's a traitor let's get rid of him Free the other criminal, but crucify Jesus. How quickly we change our hosannas for the words crucify. And we might not realize or remember, even as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, he knew what this week would be. So this morning, walk with me on Jesus on this special day. 
And let's take a closer look. So we begin our journey with Jesus in Luke chapter 19, verse 28. Jesus had just finished teaching the eight parables. And after he said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was telling parables that the people could realize in a clearer way what it meant to follow him. And at this point in Scripture, Jesus had come from Jericho, which is about 19 miles away, and it was there that he healed the blind man, blind man named Bartimaeus. He met a little guy up in a tree, and what was his name? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. And he had just spoken the parable of the ten talents. And people were amazed by his teaching and his healing, and they wanted to know who this man was. So he went 19 miles from Jericho to Bethany on his way to Jerusalem. Let's look at verses 29 through 30. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. It was likely that Jesus spent the night in Bethany at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And it was that night where Mary anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped them with her hair. Jesus was sitting there and she broke open the most expensive anointment, something that cost a great deal of money, and she washed Jesus' feet out of feeling of humbleness and honor. But there was someone that was there very upset about that act of grace. And his name was Judas Iscariot. He couldn't get over the fact that she had wasted all that expensive perfume on the feet of Jesus. If we read in John chapter 12, Judas asked, Why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 denarii? Why didn't we sell this ointment and give it to the poor? You just gave it to Jesus and his feet. And we read on that Judas didn't say that because he cared about the poor, the orphans, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag, and he wanted to steal part of it for his own needs. And after Mary washed his feet and put that ointment on his feet, Jesus said, Judas, leave her alone. She has kept some for the day of my burial. Jesus knew what was going on and what was going to happen. And he was blessed by Mary. And he was saying, Judas, just calm down. Bethpage was a city adjacent to the village of Bethany. And it was here that Jesus sends two of his disciples on a mission to get a donkey. Now this was unusual for Jesus because nowhere in the Bible do we hear that Jesus wrote anything. He went through his whole ministry walking, never riding an animal. But now here he says to the disciples, go into this village and you'll find what tied there? A donkey that has never been ridden. Go get it for me. Well, this time there weren't many horses in the area and only people that had horses were those who were extremely wealthy, the military, or those who were in nobility. Horses weren't popular, so donkeys were. So why did he choose this donkey to ride? Horses were always associated with war. When a commander came riding into a village, it meant that he meant he was ready to fight. War was on its way. But when a king or a commander came riding a donkey, it meant that I come here in peace. I want to embrace your community. I'm here to help. So it makes sense that Jesus would would choose a donkey to ride rather than a horse. But what kind of donkey was it? One that's never been ridden. A colt, just a, a little colt. Um, I looked at the Greek, it says, a, a donkey that has never been ridden, a donkey that has never been broken. Now, how many here are familiar with horses and donkeys? Anybody? Okay. Julie, I know you are. You used to ride a horse. Did you ever ride a horse that wasn't broke? Yeah. 
What would it do to you then? It would try to get you off, right? <laughs> Anybody else here have any experience with something that's been unbroken? Mark, oh, yeah. what happened? They tried to buck me off, but I'm a, there's only a pony, so they had a hard time bucking me off. <laughs> 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 yeah, poor little pony. I'd knock them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I read this in the Greek, it says, a donkey that has not been broken, a wild donkey. I wondered why would Jesus choose a wild donkey? A wild donkey would want to throw you in the dirt to buck you off. But he specifically asked for a colt that had never been ridden before. Not broke. Why? Well, let's think about this. Jesus hopped on this unbroke donkey and he rode it into Jerusalem. Any evidence that he got bucked off? No. Here it shows that Jesus calmed a stubborn animal like a donkey. An animal that has its own mind, that wants to do its own thing and buck you off and go his own way. But Jesus rode him into Jerusalem. He had submission over that donkey. Even in all of its stubbornness, Jesus rode the donkey. And I believe that goes into contrast of the hearts of the people that would see Jesus coming into town. Because there are a lot of stubborn people that watched what was happening and their hearts would not be changed by Jesus. But also, in contrast, there are a lot of stubborn people that learn to love Jesus as their Savior. An unbroken donkey, and Jesus rides that into Jerusalem. Let's continue reading 32 through 34. Those who were sent ahead found just as it had told them about the donkey. And as they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. Jesus needs it. Again, we don't know for sure, but let's speculate for a moment. Jesus could have made arrangements with the owners of that donkey the last time that he was in Jerusalem. He may have came up to those owners and said, the next time I'm in town, you know, I'm going to need your little donkey and I'm going to send two guys after him. But what's significant here is the disciples said, the Lord needs it. These guys are watching these guys untie their donkey and they say, what are you doing? Are you stealing this animal? And they say, no. The Lord needs it. And what's amazing is, they let the donkey go. They didn't pay for it. They didn't give a deposit. They didn't sign a contract or a lease. The owners just let the donkey go. How are we when it comes to when the Lord needs it in our life? It seems like everything we have is ours, and I'm going to keep it, I'm going to control it, I'm going to use it the way I want to. But do we ever see that everything we have is the Lord's? Who owned the donkey in the first place? God did. In reality, everything belongs to Jesus anyway. It was Jesus who spoke to the world and it was created, everything in it. And we're just stewards of everything that God has given to us and he has allowed us to keep these things. Everything we have, everything, should be put to the Master's use. That little thing you drive, Jeff, we talk about it often. <laughs> that thing you can put in the back pocket. Love it. You know, who's it belong to? The title may say Jeff Stevens, right. right? But who does it belong to? Jesus. Absolutely. Do we have that attitude about the things that we have? That everything that we have belongs to Jesus, can be used for his kingdom. You know, when you think about it, it's kind of arrogant to refuse these things to Jesus when he asks them in our lives. It's his in the first place. So why should we be so covetous of our earthly belongings and withhold anything from Jesus? So let's think about how can we use the things that God has blessed us with 
to serve him in his kingdom. If we have something that the Lord needs that God can use in a greater way, let them be used. The Lord needs it. And these guys said, hey, take my donkey. Let's continue reading on verse 35 and 36. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats and cloaks on it, on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, the people spread their cloaks or their coats on the road. Why did they do that? Because it was a way to show honor. It was a way to show respect. It was a way to show that you're important in my life and a statement is made, I want to show you respect by putting my coat on the road in front of you. So let's picture this for a moment. Here is Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he's riding a wild donkey that's very submissive as a king would come into the community with peace. We know that he's soon going to be given a crown, but it's not a crown made with jewels, but it's a crown of thorns. You see, as the people were watching Jesus come into the city of Jerusalem, they did not want a prince of peace. They wanted a kingdom the way they wanted their kingdom. They wanted a prince of war. They didn't want to be under the authority of Rome and all the heavy taxes, but they also didn't want to be under the authority of the church. They wanted Jesus to fight for the people. And as I was thinking about that, we still have that problem in our world today. Right? We want a Savior who says, we're not, He's not going to allow anybody to go to hell. We see that as a popular theology in growing churches. God's not going to send anybody to hell. We believe in justice as long as it doesn't condemn. Oh, let's just all be lovey-dovey and let's all get along and everybody's going to be happy, right? How many here believe there's a hell? Amen. But the people there just wanted everybody just to get along. we got a new king coming into town. He's going to keep us from the Romans, and he's going to keep us from the, the absurdities of the church, and everybody's just going to be happy. The same is true in our lives today. We don't mind crowning Jesus as the Lord of our lives as long as we don't have to submit to his rule and authority in our lives, right? Oh, we, we believe in Jesus. But don't ask anything for me. Am I wrong? We live in a society that, oh, we want all the good things from Jesus and the church. But we don't want to do the difficult things. We want a Savior that's going to take us to heaven, but we don't want to live for him on the throne while we're alive, right? Same people in Jerusalem, the same people today in our world today. We want all the good stuff, but we don't want the challenges. Jesus wasn't the Savior that they expected or they even wanted. They had the wrong expectation of Jesus. Sometimes maybe we want to put Jesus together as the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and Santa Claus all wrapped up in one. Give us all the good things. Give us all the benefits, but don't ask for control of my life. I don't want you to be Lord of my life because I've got that all covered. I can do my things my way. Don't make me submit to you. I just want to live my life. So there we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem. The people that wanted a king just for their own purposes. To help them. But not a king that would save them. In verse 37 and 38, let's continue to read. When he came close to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they'd seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Now this is quite a celebration going on here. A large crowd had, had followed Jesus. They heard about his miracles. They heard about who he was. They were spreading their cloaks on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road and waving them in the air. It was the kind of welcome that you'd give a conquering king. This, this is a cool deal going on here. This is the king. 
But let's pause for a moment and think about who was in the crowd that day. I guarantee you there are those in the crowd that Jesus had healed. The men with leprosy. They were washed clean. Can you imagine them standing there? I remember Jesus, he gave me my life back. <laughs> Maybe it was one of those that were at the day when Jesus was teaching and they were hungry and there was a little boy with what? Fish. A few fish and a few loaves, right? And he fed, fed the miracle and fed all the people that were there. And Maybe there were some there that day saying, I remember Jesus, you know, he fed me. He gave me food. Maybe Zacchaeus was there. Just a few days earlier, his life had been changed. The people that listened to his teachings, I'm sure they were there and they thought, you know, this man taught in parables and ways that I could understand about the kingdom of God. And he told a story about a prodigal son that, that was, took all of his father's inheritance and ran away and wasted his father's inheritance. And he came back to the father and his father welcomed him. I remember that story that Jesus taught. And maybe that person was standing there. There are those who loved him. I, I guarantee you Bartimaeus was there. He was the man the day before was healed from his blindness. Can, can you imagine that? All of a sudden he could see. He's going to follow Jesus everywhere. He's no longer a beggar sitting at the city gate asking for money. He could see and now he could work. Little Zacchaeus, crooked guy, a tax collector. He paid back all his debts to society. And he made his peace with God for the first time in his life. He felt forgiven. Can you imagine that little guy? Said, I'm going to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Yeah. Jairus' daughter. I bet Jairus is there. And his daughter, and what did he do for her? He raised her back to life after she had died. Man, if Jesus would have raised my daughter back to life after she died, I'd be there following him. I'd be his greatest supporter and fan. And they were all in that crowd shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and waving the branches back and forth. And Jesus is looking around and seeing their smiles and, hey, I remember you, I healed you, and I remember you, you, you heard my teaching. And then there was probably Lazarus and Mary and Martha and Mary Magdalene. They were all there. And they reflected the love that they had for Jesus. And they were standing there with smiles on their faces, waving their palm branches, Jesus, we love you. But you know, there are more people there. There are those that had evil and sinister faces there also. I can see as Jesus looks over the crowd, there are those, those people there with squinty eyes and, I hate you, Jesus. I'm going to take you down, Jesus. I can't wait till you speak a false word and everything is going to come down on you, Jesus. Those guys with squinty faces and eyes, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were the ones that were supposed to keep the law. They were the spiritual leaders, not this man named Jesus. And we're going to get you out of our life. Jesus had become so popular in his teachings and his following that they felt threatened by him. And they were filled with jealousy. And as they watched him go by on that donkey, they're thinking, we're going to get even someday. And then there were the Romans there. Wondering what in the world is going on. He claims to be king. He's not our king. And they're just waiting for that point where Jesus would say, I'm going to be a new king. They're looking for some kind of rebellion against Rome. And they were ready to crush any uprising. And as Jesus came through there, as they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, he knew that it wouldn't be long until they would be saying the words, Crucify him. Crucify him. Kill him. And that's where we read in the crowd, verse 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. 
And Jesus says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Here we have the teachers of the law. They were just so torqued off. They were upset. People were praising Jesus, and the Pharisees were saying, Oh, Jesus, you got this all wrong. Tell them to be quiet. It's only Yahweh that deserves our praise, not you. Tell your people to be quiet. Jesus said, you know what? I can tell them to be quiet. But if they are silenced, God will even have the rocks cry out in praise. Can you imagine that? Jesus is going to get praise. And when our mouths are silent and when we stop praising God, the earth itself will shout out in praise of Jesus. There's a lot of people who say they love Jesus on Sunday. And they shall crucify with the rest of their lives during the rest of the week. Oh, we love Jesus. Sing the old hymn, Oh, how we love Jesus. And we go to our crooked ways on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, telling lives, hurting others, and selfish living. It's then that we're shouting, Crucify Him, Crucify Him. In that crowd that day, there were the jealousy of the religious, religious leaders. And they say, Jesus, just be quiet. And Jesus says, there's no way I can be quiet, and they can be quiet. Here we are in Jerusalem. Following the parade, there were loving faces and sinister faces, anxious, anxious apostles, crowds trampling <clears throat> upon one another. When all of a sudden everything stopped. Never had that? You're going down the road, you're cruising down the interstate, everything is happy, and all of a sudden the traffic just comes to a stop. You truck drivers know what that's like. You go you know, down here. It's like you're sitting on M6 out here and you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs because something has happened in front of you. You're like, what's going on? Well, this is kind of what's happened here. We have the parade going. Everybody's shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus is moving on. And all of a sudden, everything comes to a stop. And I can just about hear the people on the way back saying, you know, what's the holdup? Come on, guys. Let's keep on moving on to Jerusalem. But the people who were closest to Jesus could see and realized that it was Jesus who stopped the parade. Now think about this. There was so much joy and excitement. There was hatred there. And all of a sudden the parade stops and the disciples could see Jesus' body shake. And maybe they thought he was laughing because there was so much joy that morning. Because that, that, that seemed normal that Jesus maybe saw a little boy or a little girl on the side of the road and waving at him, he just stopped to laugh. But that wasn't the case. Jesus stopped. And he looked around at the people. He looked in their faces. He looked in their eyes and he saw the kids. He saw struggle. He saw disease. He saw pain. He saw the hatred. He saw the anger. He saw brokenness. And he stopped to cry. The tears that flowed down his face that day were tears of love. Because he looked at people he loved and he cared for. He looked at that priest's eyes who hated him. But Jesus loved him. He looked at that Roman soldier's eyes that were just waiting for him to mess up so that the soldier could throw a spear his way. And Jesus loved him. I'll confess to you this morning, I'm a big crybaby. I learned that from my dad. My dad was a very emotional guy. He was six foot five, a big, rough and tough Iowa farmer. But he had a heart softer than anything. 
You know, I, I watch television, I see these dog commercials with the SBCA, and these little dogs. Uh, I want to cry. You know, there's that little dog standing in the snow with his eye popping out, and I'm just like, oh, no. You know, where do I do? You know, where can I get the money to help that dog? You know, lucky I got Danica on me, you know. Movies are terrible. You know, I, we could sit in a movie theater, and I'm like, I'm looking around at my wife, and I can see a tear coming down her face, and I start, you know, oh, geez, you know, what am I going to do, you know, and my heart is broken. Anybody softies like that? Oh, yeah. yeah, a few of you out there, yeah. You know, I, I want the best for others, and I don't want to see anybody struggle, and, you know, I'm just a, a big softie. And you can even see, like this morning, when I'm talking about something so passionate of Jesus' love for us, that he loved a person like me, I get emotional. And at uh, my previous church, a man came to the congregation sister meeting one night, the leadership meeting, and said, you know, I got a complaint against Pastor Brad. He gets too emotional in his preaching. And he says, when he's emotional, I get uncomfortable, and he says, I, I just... He needs to stop being emotional. Well, I guess I can't stop being emotional. Because it's a passion I have. It's who I am. And when I can talk about a love as powerful as the love of Jesus Christ, the powerful love standing in that parade, looking at the people around him, he knew their hearts, he knew what they wanted in life, and he was brought to tears. Jesus passed the Mount of Olives. He had the full view of the city in front of him. And he just had to cry. How many of you just, just need a good cry at times? Come on, guys, don't be so tough, you know. Sometimes it's good just to, to let it all out. It wasn't because Jesus knew what was going to happen in a few days. He knew all about the crucifixion. But I believe that he cried because he loved the people so much. It's reported only two times in Scripture that he cried. He cried just before he raised Lazarus from the dead, and that was one of his best friends. And he cried because he saw the unbelief in the hearts of Mary and Martha. Come on, ladies, I'm Jesus. i got power. Do you believe in me? And now he sees the unbelief and the broken hearts of the Jews. And he just had to cry. There was all the people waiting to celebrate the new king. And he had to weep. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever caused someone to cry? Have you ever caused someone to cry? How does that make you feel? Oh, man. Did it now. You feel like dirt, don't you? You feel lower than dirt. I remember I made my, one of my best friend's mom cry. Oh, that was a terrible night. It was a Saturday night. Me and my best friend, we went to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We went, went to watch the Harlem Globetrotters play basketball. And that got out about 10 o'clock. And we were driving out of Sioux Falls. There was a bowling alley. And we thought, well, let's go bowling. So we start going bowling, we bowl till about 2 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, and then as we're leaving town, there's a Perkins restaurant that's open 24 hours. Well, we're a bunch of high school guys, we want to get burgers, so we sat and ate burgers. Well, this is a time before cell phones, okay? We were having fun, we were okay. We get back in the car, we drive that hour back home, and I remember driving my friend's driveway, and his mom was standing out in the front driveway there waiting for us, and she was absolutely crying. And she comes after me. Man, she was mad. <laughs> she was crying. You, you, you know, my, 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 my son, I thought he was dead. And she, she was just bawling. How do you suppose that made me feel? Awful. Awful. We weren't doing anything bad. We were just a bunch of dumb kids. But I, just, I could still, oh, I made her cry. Well, then it was worse. Our garage door at my home makes a lot of noise. 
Oh, my mother was standing there right by the door, and I walked in. Where were you? And she started crying. You feel terrible, don't you? Anybody been in that situation? Yeah? Wow. When you make someone cry, it's awkward. And it's uncomfortable. But you know what? We made Jesus cry. Did you hear that? On that day, going to Jerusalem, we were on his mind. Jesus knew us. Someone's phone's ringing. Dream, is that yours? <laughs> we were the ones that made Jesus cry, right? How does it make you feel? Here is the guy that loves us so much, so ultimately, and he looks in our lives and sees where we have failed, sees where we have placed ourselves above others, where we've broken down in sin. We're the ones that made him cry. We shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet we're the ones that made Jesus cry. Both Matthew and Luke tell us sometime earlier Jesus looked down upon the city and he cried, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you're not willing. Do you hear those words? Jesus looks to us and says, I've come to give you life and have it abundantly. And so often you're not willing. And that's a word, a word to our society. The numbers of Christians in our country today are less than it was in 1970. We're going the wrong direction, folks. The churches are empty. We're living for ourselves. And we push Jesus aside. And Jesus says the same thing to us. He looks at the United States and says, I come to you to bring all my chicks under my wing. But you're not willing. And that brings us just to today. Today we stand in the presence of Jesus Christ. And I wonder what he finds as he looks at us. Does he see people that are worried about so many things, the virus and its pandemic? About our income taxes that are due now a month later? Job security, health, or lack of it? Does he see people that are so busy doing things here and there that they never have time to consider the things that are eternally important? We're so busy with our lives and the work that we have to do that we never really think about Jesus? Or today in Origins Church, let's think about this. Does he see people who recognize Jesus for who he is? I believe so. Because everyone here knows that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, our Savior, who forgives our sins. When he turns and looks in Lisa's life, or Sue Ann's life, or Keith's life? Will he see someone who loves me for who I am? Does he see in our lives that we know that he is the peace that passes all of our understanding? And we respond to Jesus with outstretched arms. Jesus, I need you. I need you more than I ever have in my life. I need you now. You know, right here at the point of Palm Sunday, Jesus wants to bring peace into our lives. He wants to carry whatever burdens that we have that's weighing us down today. But the only way Jesus can complete that in our lives is just to say, I allow you to take over my life, Jesus. It's yours. All the people gathered around him looks in their face and he knows
knows what they're thinking. And I just want to share something this morning. Jesus wants to make a triumphal entry into our hearts this morning. You believe that? You know, there have been a lot of us that we've lived in some trying times, and it gets tough, and sometimes we're ready just to throw in the towel and say, I give up, I quit, and I don't care anymore. Jesus says, I'm here. I look in your eyes, man, I'm here for you. Julie, Julie, I look in your eyes and I'm here for you. And he wants to hold you so close. Because he wants to give us triumph. And the tears of sorrow that he shed that day are tears of joy for us today, right? preparing a place in heaven for us. So it's up to you as God works in our life, as the Spirit stirs us up. Let's just open the hearts of our, the doors of our hearts and say, Jesus, it's yours. I'm yours. And I want to follow you through this next week. Because I know how much you love me. Heavenly Father, on Palm Sunday, we can get all excited about the palm branches that were raised and the, the coats on the ground as the donkey passed by and the Hosanna, Hosanna, but Father, there's a point here where he's looking at each one of us in our face and he just stops and he just starts to cry. Father, I know that you're shedding tears over your world today. People don't believe in you. People have turned their back on you. <clears throat> Father, we look at our world. Churches are empty. People are living their own ways apart from you. And Father, I just, I sense your brokenness for our country today. Father, revive us. Shake our nation up. Shake people's lives up that we can say that we need you in our hearts. That we may welcome you with a Hosanna today. That you have loved us so very much. Father, may we have tears of joy knowing that you are working in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends of peace, as you go on your way, just think about that this week. <coughs> Jesus coming into your life and looking at you. You already shed the tears of pain. May they be tears of joy as you say, You are my Lord, and you are my Savior, and my hope is in you. No doubt the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Enjoy this week, and let's see you Thursday night as we celebrate the goodness of God. Amen. <laughs>